today. Uh, here's the chart. Here's the chart for people's viewing pleasure. We are starting off with Tower of Dawn Chapter 14, if I believe. If I can find that on the list. There it is. So we will be in Tower of Dawn for a few chapters. Um, and then Empire of Storms for a chapter, and then back to Tower of Dawn. If we even get that far today. We shall see. So, Tower of Dawn is where we are starting off. <clears throat> okay. Also, I'm very, like, bouncy today. I don't know why. So if the camera shakes a bit, I apologize. It's me bouncing my legs. And all that good stuff. Okay. <clears throat> Tower of Dawn, Chapter 14 Irene didn't care if someone came to murder her in her sleep. By the time the solemn, candlelit vigil in the Torre courtyard had finished, by the time Irene crawled to her room near the top of the Torre, two acolytes propping her between them after she'd collapsed at the base of the stairs. She didn't care about anything. Cook brought her dinner in bed. Irene managed a bite before she passed out. She awoke past midnight with her fork on her chest and spiced, slow-cooked chicken staining her favorite blue gown. She groaned, but felt slightly more alive, enough so that she sat up in the near darkness of her tower room and rose only to see to her needs and haul her tiny desk in front of the door. She stacked books and any spare objects she could find atop it, checked the locks twice, and stumbled back into bed still fully clothed. She awoke at sunrise, precisely when she said she'd meet Lord Kale. <clears throat> Cursing, Irene hauled away the desk, the books, undid the locks, and flung herself down the tower stairs. She'd ordered the brace for his horse to be brought directly to the castle courtyard, and she'd left her supplies at his room yesterday, so there was nothing for her to take beyond her own frantic self as she hurtled down the endless spiral of the torre. <clears throat> scowling at the carved owls passing silent judgment while she flew by doors now beginning to open to reveal sleepy-faced healers and acolytes blinking blearily at her. Irene thanked Silbo for the restorative powers of deep, dreamless sleep as she sprinted across the complex grounds, past the lavender-lined pathways, through the just-opened gates. Antica was stirring. The streets mercifully quiet as she raced for the palace, perched on its other side. She arrived in the courtyard thirty minutes late, gasping for breath, sweat pooling in every possible crevice of her body. Lord Westfall had started without her. Gulping down air, Irene lingered by the towering bronze gates, the shadows still lying thick with the sun so low on the horizon, and watched the unfolding mounting. As she'd specified, the patient-looking roan mare was on the shorter side, the perfect height for him to reach the saddle horn with an upraised hand, which he was currently doing, Irene noted with no small degree of satisfaction. But the rest? Well, it seemed he decided not to use the wooden ramp that she also ordered crafted in lieu of a stepping, stepped mounting block. The mounting ramp now sat by the still-shadowed horse pens against the eastern wall of the courtyard, as if he'd outright refused to even go near it and instead had them bring over the horse to mount the mare on his own. It didn't surprise her one bit. Kale did not look at any of the guards clustered around him, at least more than was necessary. With their backs to her, she could only identify one or two by name, but one stepped in silently to let Kale brace his other hand on his armor-clad shoulder as the lord pushed himself upright in a mighty heave. The mayor stood patiently while his right hand gripped the saddle horn to balance himself. She stepped forward just as Lord Westfall pushed off the guard's shoulder and into the saddle, the guard stepping in close as he did it. It left him sitting side saddle, but Kale still did not give the guard much thanks beyond a tight nod. Instead, he silently studied the saddle before him, assessing how he was to get one leg over the other side of the horse. Color stained his cheeks his jaw a tight line. 
The guards lingered, and he stiffened, tighter and tighter. But then he moved again, leaning back in the saddle and hauling his right leg over the horn. The guard who'd helped him lunged to support his back, another darting from the other side to keep him from tumbling off. But Chaos Torso remained solid, unwavering. His muscle control was extraordinary. A man who had trained that body to obey him no matter what, even now. And he was in the saddle. Kale murmured something to the guards that had had them backing off as he leaned to either side to buckle the straps of the brace around his legs. It had been set into the saddle, the fit perfect based on the estimations she'd given the woman in the workshop, designed to stabilize his legs, replacing where his thighs would have clamped to keep him steady. Just until he became used to riding. He might very well not need them at all, but it was better to be safe for his first ride. Irene wiped her sweaty forehead and approached, offering a word of thanks to the guards, who now flittered back to their posts. The one who directly helped Lord Westfall turned in her direction, and Irene gave him a broad smile as she said in Helha, Good morning, Shen. The young guard returned her smile as he continued toward the small stables in the far shadows of the courtyard, winking at her as he passed by. Morning, Irene. She found Kale sitting upright in the saddle when she faced ahead once more, that stiff posture and clenched jaw gone as he watched her approach. Irene straightened her dress, realizing just as she reached him that she still wore yesterday's clothes, now with a giant red splotch on her chest. Kale took in the stain, then her hair. Oh, God's her hair! And only said, Good morning. Irene swallowed, still panting from her run. I'm sorry I'm late. Up close, the brace indeed blended in enough for most people not to notice, especially with the way he carried himself. He sat tall and proud on that horse, shoulders squared, hair still wet from his morning bath. Irene swallowed again and inclined her head toward the unused mounting ramp across the courtyard. That was also meant for you to use, you know. He lifted his brows. I doubt there will be one readily available on a battlefield, he said, mouth twisting to the side. So I might as well learn to mount on my own. Indeed. But even with the crisp golden dawn around them, what she glimpsed within his wounds, the army they might both face, flashed before her, stretching the long shadows. Motion caught her eye, snapping Irene to alertness as Shen led a small white mare from the same shadows, saddled and ready for her. She frowned at her dress. If I'm riding, Kale said simply, so are you. Perhaps that was what he'd muttered to the guards before they dispersed. Irene blurted. I'm not. It's been a while since I rode on. Road one. If I can let four men help me onto this damned horse, he said simply, the color still blooming in his cheeks, then you can get on one too. From the tone, she knew it must have been embarrassing. She'd seen the expression on his face just now. But he'd done it. Gritted his teeth and done it. And with the guards helping him, she knew there were multiple reasons why he could barely glance at them. That it was not just the lone reminder of what he'd once been that made him tense up in their presence, refused to even consider training with them. But that was not a con conversation to be had now. Not here, and not with the light starting to return to his eyes. So Irene hitched up her hem and let Shen help her onto the horse. The skirts of her dress hiked up enough to reveal most of her legs, but she'd seen far more revealed here, in this very courtyard. Neither Shen nor any other guard so much as glanced her way. She turned to Kaol to order him to go ahead, but found his eyes on her. On the leg exposed from ankle to mid-thigh, paler than most of her golden brown skin. She darkened easily in the sun, but it had been months since she'd gone swimming and basked in any sunlight. Kaol noticed her attention and snapped his eyes up to hers. You have a good seat, he told her as clinically as she often remarked on the status of her patients' bodies. Irene gave him an exasperated look before nodding her thanks to Shen and nudging her horse into a walk. 
Kale snapped the reins and did the same. She kept one eye on him as they rode toward the courtyard gates. The brace held. The saddle held. He was peering down at it, then at the gates, at the city awakening beyond them, the tower jutting high above it, all as if it were a hand raised in bold welcome. Sunlight broke through the open archway, gilding them both, but Irene could have sworn it was far more than the dawn that shone in the captain's brown eyes as they rode into the city. It was not walking again, but it was better than the chair. Better than better. The brace was cumbersome, going against all his instincts as a rider, but it held him firm, allowed him to guide Irene through the gates, the healer clutching the pommel every now and then, forgetting the reins entirely. Well, he'd found one thing she wasn't so self-assured at. The thought brought a smile to his lips, especially as she kept adjusting her skirts. For all she chided him about his modesty, flashing her legs had given her pause. Men in the streets, workers and peddlers and city guards, looked twice, looked their fill, until they noticed his stare and averted their eyes. And Kale made sure they did. Just as he'd made sure the guards in the courtyard had kept their attention polite the moment she'd run in, huffing and puffing, sun-kissed and flushed, even with the stain on her clothes, even wearing yesterday's dress and coated in a faint sheen of sweat. It had been mortifying to be helped into the saddle, like unruly baggage, after he'd refused the mounting ramp. Mortifying to see those guards in their pristine uniforms, the armor on their shoulders and hilts of their swords glinting in the early morning sunlight all watching him fumble about. But he dealt with it. And then he found himself forgetting that entirely at the appreciative glances the guards gave her. No lady, beautiful or plain, young or old, deserved to be gawked at. And Irene. Kale kept his mare close beside hers, met the stare of any man who glanced their way as they rode toward the towering spire of the Torre, the stones pale as cream in the morning light. Every single man swiftly found somewhere else to gape. Some even looked apologetic. Whether Irene noticed, he had no clue. She was too busy lunging for the saddle horn at any unexpected movements of the horse, too busy wincing as the mare increased her pace up a particularly steep street, causing her to sway and slide back in her saddle. Lean forward, he instructed her. Balance your weight. He did the same, as much as the brace allowed. Their horses slowly plowed up the streets, heads bobbing as they worked. Irene gave him a sharp glare. I do know those things. He looked at his brows in a look that said, could have fooled me. She scowled, but faced ahead, leaned forward as he'd instructed her. He'd been sleeping like the dead when Nesrin returned late last night, but she'd roused him long enough to say she hadn't discovered anything in regard to potential Volg in the city. No sewers connected to the Torre, and with the heavy guard at the walls, no one was getting in that way. He'd managed to hold on to consciousness long enough to thank her and hear her promise to keep hunting today. But this cold, cloudless, bright day, definitely not the Vogue's preferred darkness. Aelin had told him how the Vogue princes could summon darkness for themselves. Darkness that struck down any living creature in its path, draining them dry. But even one Vogue in the city, regardless of whether they were a prince or an ordinary grunt, Kale pushed the thought from his mind, frowning up at the mammoth structure that grew more imposing with each street they crossed. Towers, he mused, glancing toward Irene. Is it a coincidence you bear that name, or did your ancestors once hail from the Torre? Her knuckles were white as she gripped the pommel, as if turning to look at him would send her toppling off. I don't know, she admitted. My... It was knowledge that I never learned. He considered the words, the way she squinted at the bright pillar of the to tower ahead, rather than meet his stare. A child of Fenharrow. He didn't dare ask why she might not know the answer. Where her family was. Instead, he jerked his chin to the ring on her finger. Does the fake wedding band really work? She examined the ancient scuffed ring. I wish I could say otherwise, but it does. You encounter that behavior here? In this wondrous city? Very, very rarely. 
She wrinkled her fingers before settling them around the saddle's pommel again. But it's an old habit from home. For a heartbeat, he recalled an assassin in a bloody white gown, collapsing at the entrance to the barracks. Recalled the poisoned blade the man had sliced her with, and had used with countless others. I'm glad, he said after a moment, that you don't need to fear such things here. Even the guards, for all their ogling, had been respectful. She'd even addressed one by name, and his return warmth had been genuine. Irene clenched the saddle horn again. The Kagan holds all people accountable to the rule of the law, whether they're servants or princes. It shouldn't have been such a novel concept yet. Kaol blinked. Truly? Irene shrugged. As far as I have heard and observed, lords cannot buy their way out of crimes committed, nor rely on their family names to bail them out, and would-be criminals in the streets see the exacting hand of justice and rarely dare to tempt it. A pause. Did you? He knew what she balked at asking. I was ordered to release or look the other way for nobility who had committed crimes. At least. The ones who were of value in court and in the king's armies. She studied the pommel before her. And your new king? He is different. If he was alive. If he had made it out of Riftold. Kale forced himself to add. Dorian has long studied and admired the Kaganate. Perhaps he'll put some of its policies into effect. A long, assessing glance now. Do you think the Kagan will ally with you? He hadn't told her that, but it was fairly obvious why he'd come, he supposed. I can only hope. Would his forces make that much of a difference against the powers you mentioned? Kale repeated. I can only hope. He couldn't bring himself to voice the truth that their armies were few and scattered, if they existed at all, compared to the gathering might of Morath. What happened these months? A quiet, careful question. Trying to trick me into talking? I want to know. It's nothing worth telling. His story wasn't worth telling at all, not a single part of it. She fell silent, the clapping of their horses' hooves the only sound for a block, then... You will need to talk about it. At some point. I beheld glimpses of it within you yesterday. Isn't that enough? The question was sharp as the knife at his side. Not if it is what that thing inside you feeds on. Not if claiming ownership of it might help. And you're so certain of this? He should mind his tongue. He knew that, but... Irene straightened in her saddle. The trauma of any injury requires some internal reflection during the healing and aftermath. I don't want it. Need it. I just want to stand. To walk again. She shook her head. He charged on. And what about you, then? How about we make a deal? You tell me all your deep, dark secrets, Irene Towers, and I'll tell you mine. Indignation lit those remarkable eyes as she glared at him. He glared right back. Finally... Irene snorted, smiling faintly. You're as stubborn as an ass. I've been called worse, he countered, the beginnings of a smile tugging on his mouth. I'm not surprised. Kale chuckled, catching the makings of a grin on her face before she ducked her head to hide it, as if sharing one with the son of Adderlin were such a crime. Still, he eyed her for a long moment, the humor lingering on her face. The heavy, softly curling hair that was occasionally caught in the morning breeze off the sea. And found himself still smiling as something coiled tight in his chest began to loosen. They rode the rest of the way to the Tore in silence. And Kaol tipped his head back as they neared, walking down a broad, sunny avenue that sloped upward to the hilltop complex. The Tore was even more dominating up close. It was broad, more of a keep than anything but still rounded. Buildings flanked its side, sides, connected on lower levels, all enclosed by towering white walls. The iron gates, fashioned to look like an owl spreading its wings, thrown wide to reveal lavender bushes and flower beds lining the sand-colored gravel walkways. Not flower beds. Herb beds. The smells of them opening to the morning sun filled his nose. Basil and mint and sage and more of that lavender. 
Even their horses, hooves crunching on the walkways, seemed to sigh as they approached. Guards in what he assumed were torre colors, cornflower blue and yellow, let them pass without question, and Irene bowed her head in thanks. They did not look at her legs, did not either dare or have the inclination to disrespect. Kale glanced away from them before he could meet their questioning stares. Irene took the lead, guiding them through an archway and into the complex courtyard. Windows of the three-story building wrapped around the courtyard gleamed <clears throat> with the light of the rising sun. But inside the courtyard itself, beyond the murmur of awakening Antica outside the compound, beyond the hooves of their horses on the pale gravel, there was only the gurgle of twin fountains anchored against parallel walls of the courtyard. Their spouts shaped like screeching owl beaks, spewing water into the deep basins below. Pale pink and purple flowers lined the walls between lemon trees. The beds tidy but left to grow as the plants willed. It was one of the more serene places he had ever laid eyes on. In watching them approach, two dozen women in dresses of every color, though most of the simple make Irene favored. They stood in neat rows on the gravel, some barely more than children, some well into their prime. A few were elderly, including one woman, dark-skinned and white-haired, who strode from the front of the line and smiled broadly at Irene. It was not a face that had ever held any beauty, but there was a light in the woman's eyes, a kindness and serenity that made Kay all blink in wonder. All the others watched her, as if she were the axis around which they were ordered, even Irene, who smiled at the woman as she dismounted, looking graceful, looking grateful to be off the mare. One of the guards who had trailed them in came to retrieve the horse, but hesitated as Kale remained astride. Kale ignored the man as Irene finger combed her tangled hair and spoke to the ancient woman in his tongue. I take it the good crowd this morning is thanks to you. Light words, perhaps an attempt at normalcy, considering what had happened in the library. The old woman smiled. Such warmth. There was she was brighter than the sun peeking above the compound walls. The girls heard a rumor of a handsome lord coming to teach. I was practically trampled in the stampede down the stairs. She cast a wry grin to three red-faced girls, no older than fifteen, who looked guiltily at their shoes, and then shot looks at him beneath their lashes that were anything but. Kale stifled a laugh. Irene turned to him. Assessing the brace and the saddle as the crunch of approaching wheels on gravel filled the courtyard. The amusement faded. Dismounting in front of these women? Enough. The word sounded through him. If he could not endure it in front of a group of the world's best healers, then he would deserve to suffer. He had offered his help. He would give it. For indeed, there were some younger girls in the back who were pale, shifting on their feet, nervous. This sanctuary, this lovely place, a shadow had crept over it. He would do what he could to push it back. Lord Kaol Westfall, Irene said to him, gesturing to the ancient woman. May I present Hafiza, healer on high of the Torre Chesme. One of the blushing girls sighed at the sound of his name. Irene's eyes danced, but Kaol inclined his head to the old woman as she extended her hands up to him. The skin was leathery, as warm as her smile. She squeezed his fingers tightly. As handsome as Irene said. I said no such thing, Irene hissed. One of the girls giggled. Irene cut her a warning look, and Kale lifted his brows before saying to Afiza, It is an honor and a pleasure, my lady. So dashing, one of the girls murmured behind him. Wait until you see my dismount he almost said. Hafiza squeezed his hands once more and dropped them. She faced Irene, waiting. Irene only clapped her hands together and said to the girls assembled, Lord Westfall has suffered a severe injury to his lower spine and finds walking difficult. Yesterday, Sindra and the workshop crafted this brace for him, based upon the designs from the horse tribes in the steppes who have long dealt with such injuries for their riders. She waved a hand to indicate his legs. The brace. With every word, his shoulders stiffened, more and more. 
If you are faced with a patient in a similar situation, Irene went on, the freedom of riding may be a pleasure, may be a pleasant alternative to a carriage or palanquin, especially if they were used to a certain level of independence beforehand, she added upon consideration. Or even if they have faced mobility difficulties their entire lives, it may provide a positive option while you heal them. Little more than an experiment. Even the blushing girls had lost their smiles as they studied the brace. His legs. Irene asked them. Who should like to assist Lord Westfall from his mount to his chair? A dozen hands shot up. He tried to smile. Tried and failed. Irene pointed at a few who rushed over. None looked up at him above the waist or even bid him good morning. Irene lifted her voice as they crowded around her, making sure those assembled in the courtyard could also hear. For patients completely immobilized, this may not be an option, but Lord Westfall retains the ability to move above his waist and can steer the horse with the reins. Balance and safety, of course, remain concerns, but another is that he retains use and sensation of his manhood, which also presents a few hiccups regarding the comfort of the brace itself. One of the younger girls let out a giggle at that, but most only nodded, looking directly at the area indicated, as if he had no clothes on whatsoever. Face heating, Kale restrained the urge to cover himself. Two young healers began unstrapping the brace, some examining the buckles and rods. Still, they did not look him in the eye, as if he were some new toy, new lesson, some oddity. Irene merely went on. Mind you don't jostle him too much when you- Careful! He fought to keep his features distant, found himself missing the guards from the palace. Irene gave the girls firm, solid directions as they tugged him down from the saddle. He didn't try to help the acolytes, or fight them, when they pulled at his arms, someone going to steady his waist, the world tilting as they hauled him downward. But the weight of his body was too great, and he felt himself slide farther from the saddle the drop to the ground looming, the sun a brand on his skin. The girls grunted, someone going to the other side to help move his leg up and over the horse. Or he thought so. He only knew it because he saw her head of curls just peek over the, horns, the horse's side. She pushed, jutting his leg upward, and he hung there, three girls gritting their teeth while they tried to lower him, the others watching in observational silence. One of the girls let out an oomph and lost her grip on his shoulder. The world plunged. Strong, unfaltering hands caught him, his nose barely half a foot from the pale gravel as the other girls shuffled and grunted, trying to heft him up again. He'd come free of the horse, but his legs were now sprawled beneath him, as distant from him as the very top of the torre high above. Roaring filled his head. A sort of nakedness crept over him. Worse than sitting in his undershorts for hours. Worse than the bath with the servant. Irene, gripping his shoulder from where she'd just barely caught him in time, said to the healers, That could have been better, girls. A great deal better, for many reasons. A sigh. We can discuss, discuss what went wrong later, but for now, move him to the chair. He could barely stand to hear her, listen to her, as he hung between those girls most of whom were half his height. Irene stepped aside to let the girl who dropped him back into place, whistling sharply. Wheels hissed on gravel from nearby. He didn't bother to look at the wheeled chair that an acolyte pushed closer. Didn't bother to speak as they settled on him in it, the chair shuddering beneath his weight. Careful, Irene warned again. The girls lingered, the rest of the courtyard still watching. Had it been seconds or minutes since this ordeal had begun? He clenched the arms of the chair as Irene rattled off some directions and observations. Clenched the arms harder as one of the girls stooped to touch his booted feet. To arrange them for him. Words rose up his throat. And he knew that they'd burst from him. Knew he could do little to stop his bellow to back off as the acolyte's fingers nearly neared the dusty black leather. Withered brown hands landed on the girl's wrist, halting her mere inches away. Hafiza said calmly, Let me. The girls peeled back as Hafiza stooped to help him instead. Get the ladies ready, Irene, 
Hafiza said over a slim shoulder, and Irene obeyed, ushering them back into their lines. The ancient woman's hands lingered on his boots, his feet currently pointing in opposite directions. Shall I do it, Lord, or would you like to? Words failed him, and he wasn't certain he could use his hands without them shaking, so he gave the woman a nod of approval. Hafiza straightened one foot, waiting until Irene had walked a few steps away and begun giving stretching instructions to the ladies. This is a place for learning, Hafiza murmured. Older students teach the younger. Even with her accent, he understood her perfectly. It was Irene's instinct, Lord Westfall, to show the girls what she did with the brace, to let them learn for themselves what it is to have a patient with similar difficulties. To receive this training, Irene herself had to venture out onto the steps. Many of these girls might not have that opportunity, at least not for several years. Kale met Hafiza's eyes at last, finding the understanding in them more damning than being hauled off a horse by a group of girls half his weight. She means well, my Irene. He didn't answer. He wasn't sure he had words. Hafiza straightened his other foot. There are many other scars, my lord, beyond the one on her neck. He wanted to tell the old woman that he knew that too damn well. But he shoved down that bareness, that simmering roar in his head. He had made these ladies a promise to teach them, to help them. Hafiza seemed to read that, sense it. She only patted his shoulder before she rose to her full height, groaning a bit, and walked back to the place left for her in line. Irene had turned toward him, stretching done, and scanned him, as if Hafiza's lingering presence had indicated something she'd missed. Her eyes settled on his, brows narrowing. What's wrong? He ignored the question within her look, ignored the bit of worry, shoved whatever he felt down deep, and rolled his chair toward her, inch by inch. The gravel was not ideal, but he gritted his teeth. He'd given these ladies his word. He would not back down from it. Where did we leave off the last lesson? Irene asked a girl in the front. I gouge, she said with a broad smile. Kaol nearly choked. Right, Irene said, rubbing her hands together. Someone demonstrate for me. He watched in silence as hands shot up, and Irene selected one, a smaller boned girl. Irene took up the stance of attacker, grabbing the girl from the front with surprising intensity. But the girl's slim hands went right to Irene's face, thumbs to the corners of her eyes. Kale started from his chair, or would have, had the girl not pulled back. And next, Irene merely asked, Hook in my thumbs like this? The girl made the motion in the air between them for all to see. And pop! Some of the girls laughed quietly at the accompanying pop the girl made with her mouth. Aelin would have been beside herself with glee. Good, Irene said, and the girl strode back to her place in line. Irene turned to him, that worry again flashing as she beheld whatever it was in his eyes, and said, This is our third lesson of this quarter. We have covered front-faced attacks only so far. I usually have the guards come in as willing victims. Some snickers at that. But today, I would like for you to tell us what you think ladies, young and old, strong and frail, could do against any sort of attack. Your list of top maneuvers and tips, if you'd be so kind. He'd trade young men ready to shed blood, not heal people. But defense was the first lesson he'd been taught, and had taught those young guards, before they'd wound up hanging from the castle gates. Russ's battered, unseeing face flashed into his mind. What good had it done any of them when it mattered? Not one. Not one of that core group he'd trusted and trained, worked with for years. Not one had survived. Rollo, his mentor and predecessor, had taught him all he knew. And what had it earned any of them? Anyone he'd encountered, he'd touched. They'd suffered. The lives he'd sworn to protect. The sun turned bleaching. The gurgle of the twin fountains a distant melody. What good had any of it done for his city, his people, when it was sacked? He looked up to find the lines of women watching him, curiosity on their faces, waiting. There had been a moment when he had hurled his sword into the Avery, when he had been unable to bear its weight at his side, in his hand, and had chucked it and everything the captain of the guard had, hand, 
had been, had meant, into the dark, eddying waters. He'd been sinking and drowning since, long before his spine. He wasn't certain if he'd even tried to swim. Not since that sword had gone into the river. Not since he'd left Dorian in that room with his father and told his friend, his brother, that he loved him and knew it was goodbye. He'd left in every sense of the word. Kale forced himself to take a breath. To try. Irene stepped up to his side as his silence stretched on, again looking so puzzled and concerned, as if she could not figure out why, why he might have been the least bit. He shoved the thought down. And the, and the others. Shoved them down to the si silt-thick bottom of the Avery where that eagle-pommeled sword now lay, forgotten and rusting. Kale lifted his chin, looking each girl and woman and crone in the face. Healers and servants and librarians and cooks, Irene had said. When an attacker comes at you, he said at last, they will likely try to move you somewhere else. Never let them do it. If you do, wherever they take you will be the last place you see. He'd gone to enough murder sites in Rifthold, read and looked into enough cases to know the truth in that. If they try to move you from your current location, you make that your battleground. We know that, one of the blushing girls said. That was Irene's first lesson. Irene nodded gravely at him. He again did not let himself look at her neck. Stomping on the incept? Instep? He could barely manage a word to Irene. First lesson also. The same girl replied instead of Irene. What about how debilitating it is to receive a blow to the groin? Nods all around. Irene certainly knew her fair share of maneuvers. Kale smiled grimly. What about ways to get a man my size or larger flipped onto their backs in less than two moves? Some of the girls smiled as they shook their heads. It wasn't reassuring. And that was chapter 14. I do gotta point out the comment that um Kale kind of made in his head that Aelin would have like loved this like the the eye gouge that the girl was demonstrating if you guys remember from all the way back to Assassin's Blade Aelin is the one that taught Irene those moves so it's just kind of like full circle like I hope and I don't, I don't want you to ruin anything and tell me. No, I'm not going to. I hope the time comes when it all gets pieced together that Irene was taught by Aelin and yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just funny how like, that's why like I read that book when, when I did in the, in the series that we, in the order that we did it in. Because like, it is kind of like. You don't technically need to know all of that information to read the rest of the series. Because um, the first time I read through the series, I hadn't read Assassin's uh, the Assassin's Blade. I didn't get that until after I had read through the rest of the series. So it was like kind of cool, like having that integrated, you get to know a bit of the backstory more. Oh, for sure. <clears throat> so, yeah. Uh, there we go. That was a long chapter. <clears throat> I like chugged like several gulps of water after that one because that one was that one was long. <laughs> okay. Continuing on to chapter fifteen. Irene felt the anger simmering off Kale as if it were heat rippling from the the kettle. Not at the girls and women. They adored him. Grinned and laughed even as they concentrated on his thorough, precise lesson. Even as the events in the library hung over them. The Torre, like a gray shroud. There had been many tears last night at the vigil. 
and a few red eyes still in the halls this morning as she'd hurtled past. Mercifully, there had been no sight of either when Lord Kale called in three guards to volunteer their bodies for the girls to flip into the gravel. Over and over. The men agreed, perhaps because they knew that any injuries would be fussed over and patched up by the greatest healers outside Dorinel. Kale even returned their smiles, ladies and, to her shock, guards alike. But Irene, she received none of them. Not one. Kale's face only went hard eyes glinting with frost whenever she stepped in to ask a question or watch him walk an acolyte through the motions. <clears throat> he was commanding, his unrelenting focus missing nothing. If they had so much as one foot in the wrong position, he caught it before they moved an inch. The hour-long lesson ended with each one of them flipping a guard onto his back. The poor men limped off, smiling broadly, mostly because Hafiza promised them a cask of ale each and her strongest healing tonic which was better than any alcohol. The women dispersed as the bells chimed ten, some to lessons, some to chores, some to patience. A few of the sillier girls lingered, batting their eyelashes toward Lord Westfall, one even looking inclined to perch in his lap before Hafiza dryly reminded her of a pile of laundry with her name on it. Before the healer on high hobbled after the acolyte, Hafiza merely gave Irene what she could have sworn was a warning, knowing look. Well, Irene said to Kale when they were again alone, despite the gaggle of girls peering out one of the torre windows. They noticed Irene stare and snap their heads back in, slamming the window with riotous giggles. Silba save her from teenage girls. She'd never been one. Not like that. Not so carefree. She hadn't even kissed a man until last autumn. Certainly had never giggled over one. She wished she had. Wished for a lot of things that had ended with that pyre and those torches. That went better than expected, Irene said to Kael, who was frowning up at the looming torre. I'm sure they'll be begging me I'm sure they'll be begging me next week for you to return. If you're interested, I suppose. He said nothing. She swallowed. I would like to try again today, if you're up for it. Would you prefer I find a room here, or shall we ride back to the palace? He met her stare then. His eyes were dark. The palace. Her stomach twisted at the icy tone. All right, was all she managed to say, and walked off in search of the guards and their horses. <clears throat> they rode back in silence. They'd been quiet during portions of the ride over, but this was... pointed. Heavy. Irene racked her memory for what she might have said during the lesson. What she might have forgotten. Perhaps seeing the guards so active had reminded him of what he did not currently have. Perhaps just seeing the guards themselves had sent him down this path. She mused over it as they returned to the palace. While he was aided by Shen and another guard into the awaiting chair, he offered only a tight smile and thanks. Lord Kale looked up at her over his shoulder, the morning heat rising enough to make the courtyard stifling. Are you going to push it, or shall I? Irene blinked. You can move it yourself just fine, she said, her proverbial heels digging in at that tone. Perhaps you should ask one of your acolytes to do it, or five of them, or whatever number you deem fit to deal with an Adarlanian lord. She blinked again, slowly, and didn't give him any warning as she strode off at a clip, not bothering to wait to see if he followed, or how fast he did. The columns and halls and gardens of the palace passed in a blur. Irene was so intent on reaching his rooms that she barely noticed someone had called her name. It wasn't until it was repeated a second time that she recognized it. And cringed. By the time she turned, Caution, clad in armor and sweating enough to reveal he'd likely been exercising with the palace guards, had reached her side. I've been looking for you, he said, his brown eyes immediately going to her chest. No, to the stains still on her dress. Caution's brows lifted. If you want to send that to the laundry, I'm sure Hassar can lend you some clothes while it is cleaned. She'd forgotten she was still in it, the stained, wrinkled dress. <clears throat> Hadn't really felt like she was quite as much of a mess until now. Hadn't felt like a barnyard animal. Thank you for the offer, but I'll manage. She took a step away, and but Caution said, I heard about the assailant in the library. 
I arranged for additional guards to arrive at the Torre after sundown every night and stay until dawn. No one will get in without our notice. It was generous. Kind. As he had always been with her. Thank you. His face remained grave as he swallowed. Irene braced herself for the words he'd voiced. He'd voice. But Kashin only said, Please be careful. I know you made your thoughts clear, but... Kashin. It doesn't change the fact that we are, or were, friends, Irene. Irene made herself meet his eyes. Made herself say, Lord Westfall mentioned your... Thoughts about Tumalun. For a moment, Kashin glanced to the white banner streaming from the nearby window. She opened her mouth, perhaps to finally offer her condolences, to try to mend this thing that had fractured between them. But the prince said, Then you understand how dire this threat may be. She nodded. I do, and I will be careful. Good, he simply said. His face shifted into an easy smile, and for a heartbeat, Irene wished she had been able to feel anything beyond mere friendship. But it had never been that way with him, at least on her part. How is the healing of Lord Westfall? Have you made progress? Some, she hedged. Insulting a prince, even one who was a former friend, by striding off was not wise. But the longer this conversation went on, she took a breath. I would like to stay and talk. Then stay. That smile broadened. Handsome. Kashin was truly a handsome man. If he had been anyone else, bore any other title. She shook her head, offering a tight smile. Lord Westfall is expecting me. I heard you rode with him this morning to the Torre. Did he not come back with you? She tried to keep the pleading expression off her face as she bobbed a curtsy. I have to go. Thank you again for the concern. And the guards, Prince. The title hung between them, pealing like a struck bell. But Irene walked on, feeling caution stare until she rounded a corner. She leaned against the wall, closing her eyes and exhaling deeply. Fool. So many others would call her a fool, and yet... I almost feel bad for the man. She opened her eyes to find Kao, breathless and eyes still smoldering, wheeling himself around the corner. Of course, he went on. I was far back enough that I couldn't hear you, but I certainly saw his face when you left when he left. You don't know what you're talking about, Irene said blandly, and resumed walking toward his suite. Slower. Don't check your pace on my account. You have made impressive time. She sliced him a glare. Did I do something to offend you today? His level stare revealed nothing, but his powerful arms kept working the wheels of his chair as he pushed himself along. Well... Why do you shove away the prince? Seems like you two were once close. It was not the time or the place for this conversation. That is none of your business. Indulge me. No. He easily kept pace with her as she increased her own, all the way to the doors to his suite. Kaja was standing outside, and Irene gave her an inane order. I need dried thyme, lemon, and garlic. That might have very well been her, one of her mother's old recipes for fresh trout. The servant vanished with a bow, and Irene flung open the suite doors, holding one wide for him to pass. Just so you know, Irene hissed as she shut the doors loudly behind him, your piss-poor attitude helps no one and nothing. Kale slammed his chair to a halt in the middle of the foyer, and she winced at what it must have done to his hands. He opened his mouth, but shut it. Right as the door to the other bedroom opened and Nesrin emerged, hair wet and gleaming. I was wondering where you went, she said to him, then gave Irene a nod of greeting. Early morning? It took Irene a few heartbeats to reorder the room, the dynamic with Nesrin now in it. Irene was not the primary person. She was the help, the secondary, whatever. Kael shook out his hands, indeed red marks marred them, but said to Nesrin, I went to the Torre to help the girls with a defense lesson. Nesrin looked at his chair. On horseback, he said. Nesrin's eyes now shot to Irene, bright and wide. You? How? A brace, Irene clarified. We were just about to resume our second attempt at healing. And you can truly ride? Irene felt Kale's inward flinch, mostly because she flinched as well. 
at the disbelief. We didn't try out anything more than a fast walk, but yes, he said calmly, evenly, like he expected such questions from Nesrin, had grown used to it. Maybe tomorrow I'll try a trot. Though without leverage from his legs, the bouncing, Irene went through her mental archives on groin injuries, but she stayed quiet. I'll go with you, Nesrin said, dark eyes lightning. I can show you the city, perhaps my uncle's home. Kale only replied, I would like that, before Nesrin pressed a kiss to his cheek. I'm seeing them now for an hour or two, said Nesrin, then meeting with, you know, I'll be back this afternoon and resume my duties afterward. Careful words. Irene didn't blame her, not with the weapons stacked on the desk in Nesrin's bedroom, barely visible through the ajar door. Knives, swords, multiple bows and quivers. The captain had a small armory in her chamber. Kale just grunted his approval, smiling slightly as Nesrin strode for the sweet doors. The captain paused in the threshold, her grin broader than any Irene had seen before. Hope. Full of hope. Nesrin shut the door with a click. Alone in the silence again, still feeling very much the intruder, Irene crossed her arms. Can I get you anything before we begin? He just wheeled forward, into his bedroom. I'd prefer the sitting room, she said, snatching her supply bag from where Kaja had set it on the foyer table, and likely rifled through it. I'd prefer to be in bed while in agony, he added over his broad shoulder. And hopefully you won't pass out on the floor this time. He easily moved himself from the chair onto the bed, then began unbuckling his jacket. Tell me, Irene said, lingering in the doorway. Tell me what I did to upset you. He peeled off his jacket. You mean beyond displaying me like some broken doll in front of your acolytes and having them haul me off that horse like a limp fish? She stiffened, pulling out the bit before dumping the supply bag on the floor. Plenty of people help you here in the palace. Not as many as you'd think. The Torre is a place of learning, and people with your injury do not come often, not when we usually have to go to them. I was showing the acolytes things that might help them with untold numbers of patients in the future. Yes, your prized, shattered horse. Look how well broken I am to you. How docile. I did not mean that, and you know it. He ripped off his shirt, nearly tearing it at the seams as he hauled it over his head. Was it some sort of punishment for serving the king? For being from Adeline? No. That he believed that she could be that cruel? That unprofessional? It was precisely what I just said. I wanted to show them. I didn't want you to show them. Irene straightened. Kale panted through his gritted teeth. I didn't want you to parade me around, to let them handle me. His chest heaved, the lungs beneath those muscles working like bellows. Do you have any idea what it is like to go from that? He waved a hand toward her, her body, her legs, her spine. To this? Irene had the sense of the ground sliding from beneath her. I know it is hard. It is, but you made it harder today. You made me sit here mostly naked in this room, and yet I have never felt more bare than I did this morning. He blinked, as if surprised he'd vocalized it. Surprised he'd admitted to it. I, I'm sorry, was all she could think to say. His throat bobbed. Everything I thought, everything I had planned and wanted, it's gone. All I have left is my king and this ridiculous slim scrap of hope that we survived this war, and this war, and I can find a way to make something of it. Of what? Of everything that crumbled in my hands. Everything. His voice broke on the word. Her eyes stung. Shame or sorrow, Irene didn't know. And she didn't want to know what it was, or what had happened to him. What made that pain gutter in his eyes. She knew. She knew he had to face it, had to talk about it, but... I'm sorry, she repeated. She added stiffly, I should have considered your feelings on the matter. He watched her for a long moment, then removed the belt from his waist, then took off his boots. Socks. You can leave the pants on if you, if you want. 
He removed them, then waited, still brimming with anger, still gazing at her with such resentment in his eyes. Irene swallowed once, twice. Perhaps she should have scrounged up breakfast. But walking away, even for that, Irene had a feeling one she couldn't quite place, that if she walked away from him, if she saw her back turn, healers and their patients required trust, a bond. If she turned her back on him and left, she didn't think that rift would be repaired. So she motioned him to move to the center of the bed and turn onto his stomach while she took up a seat on the edge. Irene hovered a hand over his spine, the muscled groove cutting deep through it. She hadn't considered his feelings, that he might have them, the things haunting him. His breathing was shallow, quick. Then he said, Just to be clear, is your grudge against me or Adderlin in general? He stared at the distant wall, the entrance to the bathing room blocked by that carved wood screen. Irene held her hand steady, poised over his back, even as shame sluiced through her. No, she had not been in her best form these past few days. Not even close. That scar atop his spine was stark in the mid-morning light, the shadow of her hand up upon his skin like some sinister mark. The thing that waited within that scar, her magic again recoiled at its proximity. She'd been too tired last night and too busy this morning to even think about facing it again, to contemplate what she might see, might battle, what he might endure too. But he'd been good up to his word, had instructed the girls despite her foolish, callous missteps. She supposed that she could only return the favor by doing as she'd promised as well. Irene took a steadying breath. There was no preparing for it, she knew. There was no bracing breath stealing enough to make this any less harrowing. For either of them. Irene silently offered Kaol the leather bit. He slid it through his teeth and clamped down lightly. She stared at him, his body braced for pain, face unreadable as he angled it toward the door. Irene said quietly, Soldiers from Adderland burned my mother alive when I was eleven. And before Kaol could, could answer, she laid her hand on the mark atop his spine. And that was chapter 15. I forget to breathe sometimes. I get listening and all worked up. And... You forget to breathe. I'm reading. I forget to breathe. And that's not good. <laughs> Love story. Such a good author. Mm -hmm. All her other books are also really good. At least <clears throat> Court of Thorns and Roses is. I haven't read the other series yet. <clears throat> I need a little bit more water. These chapters are like intense. Yeah, they very much so. Also, I apologize if I'm not doing the best at inflecting the voices to my nose being all messed up and my sinuses being all messed. It's very hard to do the different voices today. So I, I apologize if, you know, they're not as distinct as I usually try to make them. <clears throat> On to chapter 16. There was only darkness and pain. He roared against it, distantly aware of the bit in his mouth, the rawness of his throat. Burned alive, burned alive, burned alive. The void showed him fire, a woman with golden brown hair and matching skin screaming in agony toward the heavens. It showed him a broken body on a bloody bed, a head rolling across a marble floor. You did this. You did this. You did this. It showed a woman with eyes of blue flame and hair of pure gold poised above him, dagger raised and angling to plunge into his heart. He wished. Sometimes wished. He sometimes wished that she hadn't been stopped. The scar on his face from the nails she'd gouged into it when she first attacked him struck him. It was that hateful wish he thought of when he looked in the mirror. The body on the bed, in that cold room, and that scream. 
the collar on a tan throat, and a smile that did not belong to a beloved face. The heart he'd offered and had been left to drop in the wooden planks of the river docks. An assassin who had sailed away and a queen who had returned. A row of fine men hanging from the castle gates. All held within that slim scar what he could not forgive or forget. The void showed it to him again and again. It lashed his body with red, hot, pronged whips and showed him those things over and over. It showed him his mother and his brother and his father. Everything he had left, what he'd failed, what he'd hated and what he'd become. The lines between the last two had blurred. And he had tried. He had tried these weeks, these months. The void did not want to hear of that. Black fire raced down his blood, his veins trying to drown out those thoughts. The burning rose left on a nightstand, the final embrace of his king. He had tried, tried to hope, and yet... Women, little more than children hauling him off a horse, poking and prodding at him. Pain struck, low and deep in his spine, and he couldn't breathe around it. Couldn't out scream it. White light flared, a flutter far in the distance. Not the gold or red or blue of flame, but white like sunlight, clear and clean. A flicker through the dark, arcing like lightning riding through the night. And then the pain converged again. His father's eyes, his father's raging eyes when he'd announced he was leaving to join the guard. The fists, his mother's pleading, the anguish on her face the last time he'd seen her, as he'd ridden away from Annie L. The last time he'd seen his city, his home, his brother, small and cowering in their father's long shadow. A brother he had traded for another, a brother he had left behind. The darkness squeezed, crushing his bones to dust. It would kill him. It would kill him, this pain, this, this endless churning pit of nothing. Perhaps it would be a mercy. He wasn't entirely certain his presence, his presence beyond, made any sort of difference. Not enough to warrant trying, coming back at all. The darkness liked that, seemed to thrive on that. Even as it tightened the vice around his bones. Even as it boiled the blood in his veins and he bellowed and bellowed. White light slammed into him, blinding him, filling that void. The darkness shrieked, surging back, then rising like a tidal wave around him. Only to bounce off a shield that, of that white light, wrapped around him, a rock against which the blackness broke. A light in the abyss. It was warm and quiet and kind. It did not bark at, balk at that dark. As if it had dwelled in such darkness for a long, long time and understood how it worked. Kaol opened his eyes. Irene's hand had slipped from his spine. She was already twisting away from him, lunging for his discarded shirt on the bedroom carpet. He saw the blood before she could hide it. Spitting out the bit, he gripped her wrist, his panting loud to his ears. You're hurt. Irene wiped at her nose, her mouth, and her chin before she faced him. It didn't hide the stains down her chest, soaking into the neckline of her dress. Kale surged upright. Holy gods, Irene! I'm fine. The words were stuffy, warped with the blood still sliding from her nose. Is, is that common? He filled his lungs with air to call for someone to fetch another healer. Yes. Liar. He heard the falsehood in her paws, saw it in her refusal to meet his stare. Kale opened his mouth, but she laid her hand on his arm, lowering the bloodied shirt. I'm fine. I just need rest. She appeared anything but, with blood staining and crusting her chin and mouth. Irene pressed his shirt again to her nose as a new trickle slid out. At least, she said around the fabric and blood, the stain from earlier now matches my dress. A sorry attempt at humor, but he offered her a grim smile. Thought it was part of the design. She gave him an exhausted, but bemused glance. Give me five minutes, and I can go back in and... Lie down. Right now. He slid away a few feet on the mattress for emphasis. 
Irene surveyed the pillows, the bed large enough for four to sleep undisturbed beside one another. With a groan, she pressed the shirt to her face and slumped on the pillows, kicking off her slippers and curling her legs up. She tipped her head upward to stop the bleeding. What can I get you? He said, watching her stare blankly at the ceiling. She'd done this. Done this while helping him. Likely because of whatever shitty mood he'd been in before. Irene only shook her head. In silence, he watched her press the shirt to her nose. Watched blood bloom across it again and again. Until it slowed at last. Until it stopped. Her nose, mouth, and chin were ruddy with the remnants. Her eyes fogged with either pain or exhaustion. Perhaps both. So he found himself asking, How? She knew what he meant. Irene dabbed at the blood on her chest. I went in there, to the site of the scar. And it was the same as before, a wall that no strike of my magic could crumble. I think it showed me. Her fingers tightened on the shirt as she pressed it against the blood soaking her front. What? Morath, she breathed. And he could have sworn even the birds singing falter in this garden. Faltered in the garden. It showed some memory, left behind in you. It showed me a great black fortress full of horrors, an army waiting in the mountains around it. His blood iced over as he realized whose memory it might belong to. Real, or was it some manipulation against you? The way his own memories had been wielded. I don't know, Irene admitted. But then I heard your screaming. Not out here, but in there. She wiped at her nose again. And I realized that attacking that solid wall was... I think it was a distraction. A diversion. So I followed the sounds of your screaming. To you. To that place deep within him. It was so focused upon ripping you apart that it did not see me coming. She shivered. I don't know if it did anything, but... I couldn't stand it. To watch and listen. I startled it when it, I leapt in. But I don't know if it will be waiting the next time. If it will remember. There's a sentience to it. Not a living thing, but as if a memory were set free in the world. Kaol nodded, and silence fell between them. She wiped at her nose again, his shirt now coated in blood, then set the fabric on the table beside the bed. For uncounted minutes, sunshine drifted across the floor, wind rustling the palms. Then Kaol said, I'm sorry about your mother. Thinking through the timeline, it had likely occurred within a few months of Aelin's own terror and loss. So many of them, the children whom Adderlin had left such deep scars upon, if Adderlin had not left them alive at all. She was everything good in the world, Irene said, curling onto her side to gaze at the garden windows beyond the foot of the bed. She, I made it out because she, Irene did not say the rest. She did what any mother would do. He finished for her. A nod. As healers, they had been some of the first victims, and con continued to be executed long after magic had vanished. Adderlin had always ruthlessly hunted down the magically gifted healers. Their own townsfolk might have sold them out to Adderlin to make quick, cheap coin. Kaol swallowed. After a heartbeat, he said, I watched the king of Adderlin butcher the woman Dorian loved in front of me, and I could do nothing to stop it. To save her. And when the king went to kill me for planning to overthrow him, Dorian stepped in. He took on his father and bought me time to run. And I ran. I ran because there was no one else to carry on the rebellion. To get word to the people who needed it. I let him take on his father and face the consequences. And I fled. She watched him in silence. He is fine now, though. I don't know. He is free. He is alive. But is he fine? He suffered. Greatly. In ways I can't begin to... His throat tightened to the point of pain. It should have been me. I had always planned for it to be me instead. A tear slid over the bridge of her nose. Kaol scooped it up with his finger before it could slide to the other side. Irene held his stare for long moments. Her tears turning to those... Turning those eyes near radiant in the sun. He didn't know how long had passed, how long it had taken for her to even attempt to cleave that darkness, just a little. 
The door to the suite opened and closed, silently enough that he knew it was Kaja, but it drew Irene's stare away from him. Without it, there was a sense of cold, a quiet and a cold. Kaol clenched his fist, that tear seeping into his skin, to keep from turning her face toward his again, to read her eyes. But her head whipped upwards so fast she nearly knocked his nose. The gold in Irene's eyes flared. Kaol, she breathed, and he thought it might have been the first time she'd called him such. But she looked down, dragging his stare with her, down his bare torso, his bare legs, to his toes. To his toes, slowly curling and uncurling, as if trying to remember the, broom, the movement. And that was chapter 16. Oh, life with her. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> For the next chapter, we're going to be moving back to Empire of Storms. Whoever took the time to, like, painstakingly go through these two books and split up these chapters did a really good job. Yes, they did. They did a really, really good job. <clears throat> uh, stretch time. Depending on how long this next chapter is, it might be our last chapter of the night. I know when you look at the books, it doesn't feel like we're making a ton of progress. Yeah, but you're reading two at the same time. Yeah, but I, I, we're, we're making, we're making pretty decent progress, I think. If you add all those pages together of the progress. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty that's good. A lot. Yeah, if we add those two together, I would say that we've gotten through maybe a quarter. Maybe a third. Flip it over and then you'd have the two right Oh, together. you're so right. You're so right. Yeah, see? That's actually quite a I would say like a third. Around. I, I would say probably so. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like exciting but not exciting. I don't want this story to ever end. We still have one more book after this. Which is good. Which is That's awesome. like really thick. Like it's the last book is like really, really thick. Like I love all the little nuances and learning the different things and, and getting to there. But then when it's all over, then you're sad. Yeah. Yeah. Once this series like as a whole is over, there's going to be a little hole there. Uh-huh. There's going to be a little hole and you're going to be like, I want more. But there is no more. Well, but just like with it, Samsy said, just finished the last book in the series, but I still listen to you read it as I work because I miss it. Yeah, you kind of mm -hmm. miss it. And there's a reason I reread or re-listen to this story like all the time. It's my comfort series. I I love it. And the good part is that it's like so long that like I remember the overall what happens, but the little the little moments sometimes. Oh, but I imagine when you read it again. You there catch are, up on things. You, yeah, there are pieces that you, because now you know the end, there are pieces you catch in the in beginning. The, in the beginning yeah. And you go, aha. Yeah, like there's so many things that, like, I want to be able to point out to you guys and be like, aha, but I can't because that'll just spoil the entire series for you. Yep. But yeah, also, once the series is over, I made a playlist on Spotify. There is an artist who makes songs, like, writes and sings songs um based on this book series and some of the character tropes so um once the series is over i will link i will uh link the playlist that i made in the discord so that you guys can go ahead and check it out and i gotta say some of these songs are bangers like Dude, I love these songs so much. Mom has listened to some already, but she doesn't remember them. And she didn't know, like, exactly that this was before we started reading the series. So she still doesn't remember any of the importance of these songs. She's just like, yeah, it's a good song. And I can't then just. Wait till when it's done. Yeah, I don't yeah. do it until it's done because I don't want to ruin things. So. Yeah, there are a couple songs. Um, there's one song that I sent mom already. 
had mom listen to because it didn't it we already like went through that part of the book it was the um i talked about it in the previous video um the piano piece that well aelin selena played um when when with dorian there so yeah anyways anyways back to reading back to reading got a little tangent it's fine that's what the book called is for. We talk about things. We discuss the book as we read. Also, once we're done with the next book, I gotta figure out what the heck I'm gonna read next. We still got time, so get, let, let's get reading here. I'm on the edge of my seat. Yeah, but you're not even gonna figure out what happened yeah, with yeah, his feet. Yeah, I know. We still gotta know what's going on on the other side of town. Well, you're not oh. gonna figure out that cliffhanger either, because this does not start off with Manon. This starts off with a lead, so... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so you're not even gonna figure out what happened with with them either. Boy. <clears throat> That's, uh, we've got a few chapters till we find oh that out. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I know, right? Okay. <clears throat> we are switching over to Empire of Storms. Chapter 19. <clears throat> Elid Locken kept quiet during the two days she and Lorcan trekked through the eastern edges of Oakwall, heading for the plains beyond. She had not asked him the questions that seemed to matter the most, letting him think her a foolish girl, blinded by gratitude that he had saved her. He'd quickly forgotten that though he'd carried her out, she'd saved herself. And he'd accepted her name, her mother's name, without question. If Vernon was on her trail, it had been a fool's mistake, but there was no one doing it, not without raising Lorcan's suspicions. So she kept her mouth shut, swallowed her questions, like why he'd been hunting her, or who his mistress was to command such a powerful warrior, why he wanted to get into Morath, why he kept touching some object beneath his dark jacket, and why he had looked so surprised, though he tried to hide it, when she'd mentioned Selena Sardothian and Aelin Galathinius. Elite had no doubt the warrior was keeping secrets of his own, and that despite his promise to protect her, the moment he got every answer he needed, that protection would end. But she still slept soundly these last two nights, thanks to the belly full of meat courtesy of Lorcan's hunting. He'd scrounged up two rabbits, and when she'd devoured all of hers in minutes, he'd given, ha given her half of what was left in his. She hadn't bothered being polite by refusing. It was mid-morning by the time the light in the forest turned brighter, the air fresher, and then the roaring of mighty waters, the acanthus. Lorcan stalked ahead, and Elid could have sworn even the trees leaned away from him as he held up a hand in a silent motion to wait. She obeyed, lingering in the gloom of the trees, praying he wouldn't make them return to the tangle of oak wall, that she wouldn't be denied this step into the bright, wide-open world. Lorcan motioned again, to come forward. All was clear. Alid was silent as she stepped, blinking at the flood of sunshine, from the last line of trees to stand beside Lorcan on a high, rocky riverbank. The river was enormous, shades of rushing gray and brown, the last of the ice melt from the mountains, so wide and wild that she knew she could not swim it, and that the crossing had to be somewhere else, but past the river as if the water were a boundary between two worlds. Hills and meadows of high emerald grasses swayed on the other side of the acanthus, like a hissing sea under a cloudless blue sky, stretching away forever to the horizon. I can't remember, she murmured, the words barely audible over the roaring song of the river. The last time I saw. In Perant, locked in that tower, she'd only had a view of the city, Perhaps the lake of the day was clear enough. Then she'd been in that prison wagon, then in Morath, where it was only mountains and ash and armies. And during the fight with Manon and Abraxos, she had been too lost in terror and grief to notice anything at all. But now, she could not remember the last time she'd seen sunlight dancing on a meadow, or little brown birds bobbing and swooping on the warm breeze over it. The road is about a mile upriver, Lorcan said his dark eyes unmoved by the acanthus or the rippling grasses beyond. If you want your plan to work, now would be the time to prepare. She cut him a glance. You need the most work. 
A flick of black brows, Aline clarified. If this ruse is to succeed, you at least need to pretend to be human. Nothing about the man suggested this human, his human heritage held sway. Hide more of your weapons, she went on. Leave only the sword. Even the mighty blade would be a dead giveaway that Lorcan was no ordinary traveler. She fished an extra strap of leather out of her pocket, out of her jacket pocket. Tie back your hair. You'll look less... She trailed off at the faint amusement tinged with warning in his eyes. Savage, she made herself say, dangling the leather strap between them. Lorcan's broad fingers closed around it, a frown on his lips as he obeyed. And unbutton your jacket, she oh. said rummaging through her mental catalog of traits she had noted seemed less threatening, less intimidating. Lorcan obeyed that order, too, and soon the dark gray shirt beneath his tight-fitting black jacket was showing, revealing the broad, muscled chest. It looked more inclined for solid labor than killing fields, at least. And you? he said, brows still high. Alid surveyed herself and set down her pack. First, she removed the leather jacket, even though it left her feeling like a layer of skin had peeled off. Then she rolled up the sleeves of her white shirt, but without the tight leather, the full sides of her breasts could be seen, marking her as a woman and not a slip of a girl that people assumed she was. She then took to her hair, ruffling it out of its braid and restyling it into a knot atop her head. A married woman's hairstyle, not the free-flowing flo locks or plate of youth. She stuffed her jacket into her pack, standing up straight to face Lorcan. His eyes traveled from her feet to her head, and he frowned again. Bigger tits won't prove or hide anything. Her cheeks heated. Perhaps they'll keep men distracted just enough that they won't ask questions. With that, she started upstream, trying not to think about the men who had touched and sneered in that cell. But if it got her safely across the river, she'd use her body to her advantage. Men would see what they wanted to, a pretty young woman who did not bristle at their attention, who spoke kindly and warmly, someone trustworthy, someone sweet yet unremarkable. Lorcan trailed, then cut up to walk beside her like an actual companion, and not some promise-bound escort for the final half-mile around the bend of the river. Horses and wagons and shouts greeted them before the sight did. But there it was, a broad of worn stone bridge, Wagons and carts and riders lined up in droves on either side, and about two dozen guards in Adderlinian colors monitoring either bank, collecting tolls and checking wagons, inspecting every face and person. The Oaken had known about her limp. A lead slowed, keeping close to Lorcan as they neared the two-story derelict barracks on, either, on their side of the river. Down the road, flanked by the trees, a few equally sorry-looking buildings were a flurry of activity. An inn and a tavern, for travelers to wait out the lines with a drink or meal, or perhaps rent a room during inclement weather. So many people. Humans. No one appeared panicked or hurt or sickly, and the guards, despite their uniforms, moved like men while they searched the wagons passing the barracks that served as a toll house and sleeping quarters. She said quietly to Lorcan as they headed for the dirt road and the distant back of the line. I don't know what magic you possess, but if you can make my limp less noticeable. Before she could finish, a force like a cool night wind pushed against her ankle and calf, then wrapped around it in a solid grip. A brace. Her steps evened out. She had to bite back her urge to gawk at the feeling of walking straight and sure. She didn't allow herself to enjoy it. Savor it. Not when it would likely only last until they cleared the bridge. Merchant's wagons idled crammed with goods from those who hadn't wanted to risk the Avery River to the north, their drivers tight-faced at the weight and impending inspections. Elid scanned the drivers, the merchants, the other travelers. Each one of them made their instincts shout, made her instincts shout that they'd be betrayed the second they asked to ride or offered a coin to keep quiet. To trawl the line would catch the eye of the guards, so Elid used every step to study it while seemingly heading toward the back. But she reached the end of the line empty-handed. Lorcan, however, gave a pointed glance behind her, toward the tavern, whitewashed to no doubt hide the near-crumbling stones. Let's get a bite before we wait, 
he said, loud enough for the wagon in front of them to hear and dismiss it. She nodded. Someone else might be inside, and her stomach was grumbling. Except. I don't have any money, she murmured, as they approached the pale wooden door. Lie. She had gold and silver from Anon, but she wasn't about to flash it in front of Lorcan, promise or no. I've got plenty, he said tightly, and she delicately cleared her throat. He lifted his brows. You'll win us no allies looking like that, she said, and gave him a sweet little smile. Walk in there looking like a warrior, and you'll get noticed. And what am I to be, then? Whatever we need you to be when the time comes, but don't glower. He opened the door, and by the time her eyes adjusted to the glow of the wrought iron chandeliers, Lorcan's face had changed. His eyes might never be warm, but a bland smile was on his face. His shoulders relaxed, as if he were slightly inconvenienced by the weight, but eager for a, long, a good meal. He almost looked human. The tavern was packed, the noise so deafening that she could barely speak loudly enough to the nearest barmaid to order lunch. They squeezed between crammed tables, and Alid noticed that more than a few pairs of eyes went to her chest, then her face, and lingered. She pushed against the crawling feeling and kept her shoulder, kept her steps unhurried, as she aimed for a table tucked against the back wall that a weary-looking couple had just vacated. A boisterous party of eight was crammed around the table a few feet away, a middle-aged woman with a booming laugh instantly singling herself out as their leader. The others at the table, a beautiful raven-haired woman, a barrel-chested bearded man whose hands were as large as dinner plates, and a few rough-looking people, all kept looking to the older woman, gauging her responses and listening carefully to what she had to say. Alid slid into the warm wooden chair, Lorcan claiming the one across from her, his sighs earning him a look from the bearded man and the middle-aged woman at the table. Alid weighed that look. Assessment. Not for a fight. Not for a threat but in appreciation and calculation. Alid wondered for a heartbeat if Aneth herself had nudged that other couple to move away, to free up this one table for them, for that very look. Alid laid her hand out on the table, palm up, and gave Lorcan a sleepy smile as she'd once seen a kitchen maid give a Morath cook. Husband, she said sweetly, wriggling her fingers. Lorcan's mouth tightened, but, she took her, but he took her hand. Her fingers dwarfed in his. His calluses scraped against her own. He noticed it at the same moment she did, sliding his hand to cup hers so that he might inspect her palm. She closed her hand, rotating it to grip his again. Brother, Lorcan murmured so no one else could hear. I am your brother. You are my husband, she said with equal quiet. We have been married three months. Follow my lead. He glanced around, not having noticed the assessing stare they'd been given. Doubt still danced in his eyes, along with her silent question. She said simply, Men will not fear the threat of a brother. I would still be unclaimed, still be open for... Invitations. I have seen how little respect men have for anything they think they are entitled to. So you are my husband, she hissed, until I say otherwise. A shadow flickered in Lorcan's eyes, along with another question. One she didn't want to and couldn't answer. His hand tightened in on hers, demanding she look at him. She refused. Their food arrived, mercifully, before Lorcan could ask it. Stew, root vegetables, and rabbit. She dug in, nearly melting the roof of her mouth at the first bite. The group behind them began talking again, and she listened as she ate, selecting bits and pieces of what as if they were shells on a shore. Maybe we'll offer them a performance and they'll cut the toll fee in half from the blonde, bearded man. Unlikely, the leader said. Those pricks would charge us to perform. Worse, they enjoy our performance and demand we stay a while. We can't afford the wait. Not when other companies are already on the move. We don't want to hit all the Plains towns after everyone else. Alita almost choked on her stew. Aneth must have freed this table, then. Her plan had been to find a troop or carnival to fall into, disguise themselves as workers, and this. We pay full price on that toll, the beautiful woman said, and we might get to that first town half-starved and barely able to perform at all. 
Elid lifted her eyes to Lorcan's. He gave a nod. She took a sip of her stew, steeling herself, thinking of Aster and Blackbeak. Charming, confident, fearless. She'd always had her head at a jaunty angle, a looseness to her limbs, a hint of a smile on her lips. Elid took a breath, letting those memories sink into muscle and flesh and bone. Then she pivoted in her chair, an arm draped around the back as she leaned toward their table and said with a grin, Sorry to interrupt your meal, but I couldn't help but overhear your conversation. They all turned toward her, brows high, the eyes of the leader going right to Elid's face. She saw the assessment, young, pretty, unblemished by a hard life. Elid kept her own expression pleasant, wailed her eyes to brighten. Are you some sort of performing troupe? She motioned to Lorcan with a tilt of her head. My husband and I have been looking to fall in with one for weeks with no luck. Everyone's full. So are we, their leader said. Right, Alid replied merrily. But that toll is steep for anyone. And if we were to be in business together, perhaps on a temporary basis. Lorcan's knee brushed hers in warning. She ignored him. We'd be glad to chip in on the fee. Make up any difference owed. The woman's assessment turned wary. We are a carnival indeed, but we have no need of new members. The bearded man and beautiful woman shot glances at the woman, reprimand in their eyes. Elid shrugged. All right then, but in case you change your mind before you depart, my husband, a gesture to Lorcan, who was giving his best attempt at an easy smile, is an expert sword thrower. And in our previous troop, he made good coin matching himself against men who sought to best him in feats of strength. The leader turned her keen eyes on Lorcan, on the height and muscles and posture. Elid knew she'd guessed right on the vacancy they needed filled when the woman said to her, And what did you do for them? I worked as a fortune teller. They called me their oracle. A shrug. Mostly just shadows and guesswork. It'd have to be, considering the little fact that she couldn't read. The woman remained unimpressed. And what was your troop's name? They likely knew them, knew every troop that patrolled the plains. She scanned her memory for anything helpful, anything. Yellowlegs. The witches in Morath had once mentioned Baba Yellowlegs, who had traveled in a carnival to, devoid, to avoid detection, who had died in Rifthold this winter with no explanation. Detail after detail buried in the catacombs of her memory poured out. We were in the Carnival of Mirrors, Alid said. Recognition, surprise, respect, sparked in the leader's eyes. Until Baba Yellowlegs, our owner, was killed in Rifthold this past winter. We left and have been looking for work since. Where did you come from, then? The bearded man asked. It was Lorcan who replied. My family lives on the western side of the Fangs. We've spent the past few months with them, waited until the snow has melted. Since the past was so treacherous... Strange things happening, he added, in the mountains these days. The company stilled. Indeed, the raven-haired woman said. She looked to their leader. They could help pay the toll, Molly. And since Saul left, that act has been empty. Likely their sword thrower. Like I said, Elid chimed in with Asterin's pretty smile. We'll be here for a little while, so if you change your minds, let us know. If not, she saluted with her dented spoon. Safe travels. Something flashed in Molly's eyes, but the woman never, but the woman looked them over once more. Safe travels, she murmured. Alid and Lorcan returned to their meal, and when the barmaid came to take their money for it, Alid reached into her inner pocket and pulled out a silver coin. The barmaid's eyes were wide, but it was the sharp eyes of Molly, of the others at that table, that Alid noted as the girl slipped away and brought back their change. Lorcan kept silent as Elid left a generous tip on the table, but they both offered pleasant smiles to the troop as they vacated their table and the tavern. Elid went right back to the back of the line, still keeping that smile on her face, her back straight. Lorcan sidled up close, not at all noteworthy for the front they were putting on. You have no money, do you? She gave him a sidelong glance. Looks like I was mistaken. A flash of white teeth as he smiled, genuinely this time. Well, you'd better hope you, you and I have enough, Marion, because Molly's about to make you an offer. Elid turned at the crunch of dirt beneath black boots and found Molly before them, the others lingering, 
some slipping around the corner of the tavern, to no doubt retrieve the wagons. Molly's hard face was flushed as if they'd been arguing, but she just clicked her tongue and said, Temporary stint. If you're shit, you're out, and we won't pay back the money for the toll. Elid smiled, not entirely faking it. Marion and Lorcan, at your surface, madam. His wife. God's above. He was over 500 years old, and this, this girl, young woman, she-devil, whatever she was, had just bluffed and lied her way into a job. A sword thrower, indeed. Lorcan lingered outside the tavern, Marion at his side. A small troop, hence the lack of funds, and one of the said that had seen better days. He realized as the two yellow painted wagons clattered and wobbled into view, pulled by four nags. Marion carefully observed Molly climb into the driver's seat beside the raven-haired beauty, who paid Lorcan absolutely no heed. Well, having Marion as his, his god's damned wife certainly put an end to anything more than appreciation of the stunning woman. It was an effort not to growl. He hadn't been with a woman in months now, and of course, of course he'd have the time and interest in one, only to be shackled by another one's lies. His wife. Not that Marion was hard on the eyes, he noted as she obeyed Molly's barked order to climb into the back of the second wagon. Some of the other party members followed on piss-poor horses. Marion took the bearded man's extended hand and he easily hauled her into the wagon. Lorcan trailed, assessing everyone in the party, everyone in the makeshift little town. A number of men, and some women, had noticed Marion when she strode by. The sweet face paired with sinful curves. And without the limp, without her hair, with her hair out of her face. She knew exactly what she was doing. Knew people would notice those things, think about those things, instead of the cunning mind and lies she fed them. Lorcan ignored the hand the bearded man offered and jumped into the back of the wagon, reminding himself to sit close to Mary, to put an arm around her bony shoulders, and look relieved and happy to have a troop again. Supplies filled the wagon, along with five other people, who all smiled at Marion, and then quickly looked away from him. Marion put a hand on his knee, and Lorcan avoided the urge to flinch. It had been a shock earlier to feel how rough those delicate hands were. Not just a prisoner in Morath, but a slave. The calluses were old and dense enough that she likely worked for years. Hard labor from the looks of it, and with that ruined leg, he tried not to think about that tang of fear and pain he'd sensed when she told him how little she believed in the kindness and decency of men. He didn't let his imagination delve too deep regarding why she might feel that way. The wagon was hot, the air soaked with human sweat, hay, the shit of the horses lined up before them, the tang of iron from the weapons. Not much by way of belongings? asked the bearded man. Nick, he'd called himself. Shit. He'd forgotten humans traveled with baggage as if they were moving somewhere. We lost most of it on our trip out of the mountains. My husband, Marion said with charming annoyance, insisted we ford a rushing stream. I'm lucky he even bothered to help me out, since he certainly didn't go after our supplies. A low chuckle from Nick. I suspect he was more focused on saving you than on the packs. Marion rolled her eyes, patting Lorcan's knee. He nearly cringed at every touch. Even with his lovers, outside of the bed itself, he didn't like casual, careless contact. Some found that intolerable. Some thought they could break him into a decent male who just wanted a home and a good female to work beside him. Not one of them had succeeded. I can save myself, Marion said brightly. But it was throwing swords, our cooking supplies, my clothes. A shake of the head. His act might be a little lackluster until we can find somewhere to purchase more supplies. Nick met Lorcan's eyes, holding them for longer than most men dared. What he did for the carnival, Lorcan wasn't sure. Sometime performer, but definitely security. Nick's smile faded a bit. The land beyond the fangs isn't kind. Your people must be hardy folk to live out there. Lorcan nodded. A rougher life, he said, than I want for my wife. Life on the road isn't much better, Nick countered. Ah, Marion chimed in. But isn't it? A life of open skies and roads, of wandering where the wind takes you, answering to no one and nothing. A life of freedom. 
She shook her head. What more could I ask than to live a life unchecked by cages? Lorcan knew the words were no lie. He had seen her face when they beheld the grassy plain. Spoken like someone who has spent long enough on the road, Nick said. It always goes either way with our kind. You settle down and never travel again, or you wander forever. I want to see life, see the world, Marion said, her voice softening. I want to see everything. Lorcan wondered if Marion would even get to do that if he failed in his task. If the word key he carried wound up in the wrong hands. Best not wander too far, Nick said, frowning. Not with what happened in Rifthold, or what's brewing down in Morath. What happened in Rifthold? Lorcan cut in, sharply enough that Marion squeezed his knee. Nick idly scratched his wheat-colored beard. Whole city's been sacked. Overrun, they say, by flying terrors and demon women as their riders. Witches, if one is to believe the rumors. Iron Teeth, straight out of the legend. A shudder. Holy gods. The destruction would have been a sight to behold. Lorcan forced himself to listen, to concentrate and not begin calculating casualties and what it would mean for this war, as Nick continued. No word on the young king, but the city belongs to the witches and their beasts. They say to travel north is to now face a death trap. To travel south is another death trap. So, a shrug, we'll head east. Maybe we can find a way to bypass whatever's waiting in either direction. Maybe war will come and we'll all scatter to the winds. Nick looked him over. Men like you and me might get conscripted. Lorcan bit back a dark chuckle. No one could force him into anything. Save for one person, and she, his chest tightened. It was best not to think of his queen. You think either side would do that? Force men to fight? Marion's words were breathless. Don't know, Nick said, the scent and sound of the river now overwhelming enough that Lorcan knew they were near the toll. He reached into his jacket for the money Molly had demanded. Far more than their fair share. But he didn't care. These people could go to hell the moment they were safely hidden deep in the endless plains. Duke Parrington's forces might not even want us if they got witches and beasts on their side. And much worse, Lorcan wanted to say. Wordhounds and Ilkin and the gods knew what. But Aelin Galathinius, Nick mused. Marion's hand went limp on Lorcan's knee. Who knows what she will do? She has not called for aid, has not asked soldiers to come to her. Yet she held Rifthold in her grip, killed the king, destroyed the castle, but gave the city back. The bench beneath them groaned as Marion leaned forward. What do you know of Aelin? Rumors, here and there, Nick said, shrugging. They say she's beautiful as sin, and colder than ice. They say she's a tyrant, a coward, a whore. They say she's God's blessed or God's damned. Who knows? Nineteen seems awfully young to have such burdens. Rumor claims her court is strong, though. A shapeshifter guards her back, and two warrior princes plague her on either side. Lorcan thought of that shapeshifter, who had so unceremoniously vomited, not once, but twice, all over him. Thought of those two warrior princes. One of them Gavriel's son. Will she save or damn us all? Nick considered now monitoring the, the snaking line behind their wagon. I don't know if I much like the thought of everything resting in her hands, but if she wins, perhaps the land will get better. Life will get better. And if she fails, perhaps we all deserve to be damned anyway. She will win, Marion said with quiet strength. Nick's brows rose. Men shouted, and Lorcan said, I'd save talk of her for another time. Boots crunched, and then uniformed men were peering into the back of the wagon. Out, one ordered. Line up. The man's eyes snagged on Marion. Lorcan's arm tightened around her as an ugly, too familiar light filled the soldier's eyes. Lorcan bit back his snarl as he said to her, Come, wife. The soldier noticed him then. The man backed away a step, a bit pale, then ordered the supplies be searched. Lorcan jumped out first, bracing his hands on Marion's waist as he helped her off the wagon. When she made to step away, he tugged her back against him, an arm across her abdomen. He met each soldier's stare as they passed, and wondered who was looking after the dark-haired beauty in the front. A moment later, she and Molly came around. A dark-rimmed hat was slung over the beauty's head, 
half of her light brown face obscured, her body concealed in a heavy cloak that drew the eye away from any feminine curves. Even the cast of her mouth was unpleasant, as if the woman had slipped into another person's skin entirely. Still, Molly nudged the woman between Lorcan and Nick, then took the money pouch from Lorcan's free hand without so much as a thank you. The dark-haired beauty leaned forward to murmur to Marion, Don't look them in the eye and don't talk back. Marion nodded, chin dipping as she focused on the ground. Against him, he could feel her racing heart, wild despite the calm submission written over every line of her body. And you, the beauty hissed at him as the soldiers searched their wares and took what they wanted. Molly says if you get into a fight, you're gone, and we're not bailing you out of prison. So let them talk and laugh, but don't interfere. Lorcan debated saying he could slaughter this entire garrison if he pleased, but nodded. After five minutes, another order was shouted. Molly handed over Lorcan's money and her own to pay the toll, plus more for expedited passage. Then they were all back in the wagon again, none of them daring to see what had been pilfered. Marion was shaking slightly against where, her, where he kept her tucked into his side, but her face was blank, bored. The guards hadn't so much as questioned them, hadn't asked for a woman with a limp. The acanthus roared beneath them as they crossed the bridge, wagon wheels clattering on ancient stones. Marion kept shaking. Lorcan studied her face again, the hint of red along her high cheekbones, her tight mouth. Not shaking from fear, he realized as he caught a whiff of her scent. A slight tang of it, perhaps, but mostly something red-hot, something wild and ranging and... Anger. It was boiling rage that made her shake, at the inspection, at the leering of the guards. An idealist. That's what Marion was. Someone who wanted to fight for her queen, who believed, as Nick did, that this world could be better. As they cleared the other side of the bridge, the soldiers letting them pass without fuss, as they meandered past the line on that side, and emerged onto the plains themselves. Lorcan wondered at that anger, at that belief in a better world. He didn't feel like telling either Marion or Nick that their dream was a fool's one. Marion relaxed enough to peer out the back of the wagon, at the grasses flanking the wild dirt, the wide dirt road, at the blue sky, at the roaring river and the looming sprawl of Oakwald behind them. And for all her rage, a tentative sort of wonder grew in her dark eyes. He ignored it. Lorcan had seen the worst and best in men for five hundred years. There was no such thing as a better world. No such thing as a happy end. Because there were no endings. And there would be nothing waiting for them in this war. Nothing waiting for an escaped slave girl, but a shallow grave. And that was chapter 19 of Empire of Storms, and where we are going to wrap it up for tonight. Whew. As always, here is the guide for you to look at. So we just finished up chapter 19 of Empire of Storms. So next stream, we will be starting off with Tower of Dawn chapter 17, and then switching back to Empire of Storms for a few chapters.